Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is nuclear deterrence. And somehow this conversation is ultimately going to devolve into a discussion about chickens. But we're getting there. Like the lecture on compellents, we're going to use this simple game to understand what nuclear deterrence looks like. In this interaction, we have an aggressor choosing whether to quit or challenge some sort of status quo. And if the aggressor challenges, then the defender either chooses to back down, allowing the aggressor to take over the thing that has been challenged, or it can stand firm and we get ourselves involved in a conflict. Setting aside the nuclear component of this for a moment, we would describe the outcome where the aggressor quits as successful deterrence. In other words, the defender, through whatever means, has successfully convinced the aggressor not to challenge it. It has deterred that behavior. The aggressor is just quitting. The remaining two outcomes feature failed deterrence. If the aggressor challenges and the defender backs down, we would still have a peaceful outcome because the defender is not fighting. However, it has failed to deter the aggressor from engaging in the challenging behavior to begin with. Similarly, deterrence fails if the aggressor challenges and then the defender stands firm. The only difference is now we're getting a full-fledged conflict. With that, we can define nuclear deterrence. Imagine a situation where we have a non-nuclear defender and the aggressor would choose to challenge under those circumstances. Now take that same exact situation and keep everything the same except endow the defender with nuclear weapons. If the aggressor goes from challenging as they did beforehand to quitting as they are here, then we can say that we have nuclear deterrence. That's because, for whatever reason, giving the defender nuclear weapons has deterred the aggressor from challenging. It now prefers to quit. Previously, we've talked about skepticism involving nuclear compellents. That is, if you give an aggressor nuclear weapons, it's not obvious that the nuclear aggressor can now challenge and force the defender to back down as a consequence of those nuclear weapons. In contrast, there's almost a universal consensus that nuclear weapons are useful for deterring your opponent. The specifics of this are still debated to some extent. And how you construct your nuclear arsenal might matter for whether deterrence will work. That's something we'll pick up on later on in this course. The key thing, though, is that nuclear deterrence is much easier than nuclear compellents. And if you think about the barriers that come up with nuclear compellents, it's understandable why deterrence might be simpler for states to implement. The central problem for compellents is that the nuclear-armed state needs to say to its opponent, that if the opponent doesn't buckle to its demands, that the state might fire nuclear weapons at the opponent's capital, or something like that. That threat is not immediately credible. In contrast, imagine a situation where the Soviet Union is on the verge of marching into Washington, D.C. and taking over the capital. Clearly, this is something that the United States government would want to deter. And if it ever were to happen, the U.S. would face a use-it-or-lose-it situation. If they don't use their nuclear weapons at that moment, they may never have the opportunity to do so again. And moreover, the government of the United States might be gone very soon. With state survival on the line, no one cares about nuclear norms at that point. Nor will they care about how the United Nations might react. Again, if the government doesn't use their nuclear weapons at this point, the government will cease to exist. And even the threat of nuclear retaliation from the opponent is not a big deal. Aside from the political credibility of using nuclear weapons for deterrence as opposed to compellents, there are also tactical advantages. In the earlier part of the nuclear era, one of the things that the United Kingdom had devised were nuclear landmines. Dubbed Operation Blue Peacock, the idea here was that you could put nuclear weapons along Germany, and in the event of a land war with the Soviet Union invading from the east, you could detonate these weapons. 
The obvious benefit is that you would destroy any units that might be in the area at the time that the nuclear landmines went off. But there was a side benefit too. Wherever a nuclear weapon goes off, fallout rains down. Thus, those areas would be irradiated. If advancing Soviet armies tried to go through them, it might poison their soldiers and kill them in the long term. Alternatively, the advancing soldiers would have to go around those areas, but that would give the West more time to calibrate their defenses and be prepared for the oncoming assault. There was one slight problem with these blue peacock landmines, however. They were designed to sit in the ground up to seven days before they were detonated. As it turns out, continental Europe, and especially the area of Germany where these landmines were intended, can get very cold during the winter. And if you keep those weapons sitting in the ground for seven days, their electronics could freeze up, causing the nuclear weapons to malfunction and not actually detonate. And here's where chickens enter the picture. The blue peacock bombs were fairly large. So much so, that you could put chickens inside them and have them have enough room to run around. Well, if you give them enough water and give them enough food, they could survive locked inside one of these things for a week. And by moving around and generally just living their lives, these chickens would produce enough heat to keep the nuclear bombs from freezing over, allowing them to detonate as proper. As it turns out, these chicken-powered bombs were never fully deployed. The United Kingdom realized that using nuclear landmines in West Germany to protect West Germany, but simultaneously destroy West Germany, was not a real political winner. And so the project was scrapped. In any case, the key idea here is that on issues that the defender cares a whole lot about, it is going to stand firm and just see what happens in the event of conflict, rather than backing down when challenged. Moreover, because the defender has nuclear weapons in this sort of situation, the payoff for the aggressor for that stand firm outcome is going to look very bad. This could mean nuclear weapons being fired at their capital. Internalizing that, the aggressor quits. It knows that challenging will result in the defender standing firm, and it simply calculates that the costs associated with that are not worth it. Just giving up from the start is better. Wrapping up, the key takeaway here is that nuclear weapons are more useful for deterrence than they are for compellence. That's because it is more credible to use nuclear weapons for deterrent purposes than compellent purposes, and it's also just tactically easier to use them for deterring than compelling. Hope you enjoyed this, and hope to see you next time. Take care.